What's up guys? Welcome back to Fisher Hex. My name is Travis. Today we're going to be talking all about stability within your reef tank. Now this video I'm going to break it up into a couple different sections. First we're going to briefly talk about some of the benefits of having a stable reef. Next we're going to move into three of the main water parameters you should be focusing on and go into detail on how to manage them and keep them stable throughout the lifespan of your system. Then finally, we're going to talk about some of the benefits and other things to consider when keeping a stable reef tank or building a new system. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so what does stability actually mean within our hobby? Well, the definition is to keep something stable. I know that might sound simple, but what that really means is taking all the water parameters that you're responsible for, and just a few are calcium, alkalinity, salinity, temperature, pH, nitrates, phosphates. Those are some basic ones, but keeping them in the appropriate range and as stable within that range fluctuation to better the chances of success within the hobby. So that's what I consider stability to mean. Now there are many benefits to having a stable reef environment such as less coral death, faster coral growth, better coloration, better polyp extension, having healthier fish, having a bigger, more robust bacteria population to process waste, and overall just a happier, thriving reef tank. Now with knowing those benefits, we as hobbyists should try to create an environment that is stable from the very beginning. And I'll get into that here in a second. But first, I want to go over the three main water parameters that you should be focusing on and go through some ways to keep them stable. Okay, so the first one is going to be temperature. Now, I personally like to keep my tanks at 79 degrees with only a half a degree fluctuation, which is monitored and controlled by my Neptune Apex Aquarium Controller. Now, when it comes to temperature, you can get away with anything between 77 and 80 degrees. I've seen people even having their reef tanks down to 75. I've never personally done that, but I have seen people do it and actually be pretty successful. Now, what I like to do is just pick a degree that you're comfortable with. Now, of course, you don't want to be at the extreme of either one, so I wouldn't stay at 75 and I wouldn't try to stay at 80. I'd pick something in the middle, maybe a 78 or a 79. Personally, I like to stay at that 78.8 to 79.2, and again, the apex will control the fluctuation and simply turn on and off my heaters. Now, let's just say that you're just starting out and you don't want to invest the money into an aquarium controller. I completely understand. Now, what do you do instead? Well, I recommend you go out and spend as much money as you can afford on a high-quality heater with a reliable uh, thermostat and has a pretty good rating within our community. Now the reason why you want to do this is the thermostat, which is just a very small part of the heater, is what controls and dictates when the heater turns on and off. And if you buy something cheap on eBay for like 10 or 15 bucks, there's a good chance that that thermostat will fail. Now when that fails, it's either going to fail in an off position or worse, it's going to fail on the on position. Now better yet to have the tank be colder opposed to it boiling with the heater just not shutting off. So again, buying something that's a little bit higher quality will be better for you in the long run until you're ready to invest some money into an aquarium controller. Now regardless of the type of heater you're using or your aquarium controller, I recommend that you test your water temperature at least once per month with a secondary source, an accurate one at that. So finding a temperature probe that is within a half a degree of accuracy is something that I would look for. And again, it can be a little expensive, but it's really good to do this at least once per month just to make sure you can catch the calibration issues that you run into the longer you go without recalibrating a probe on an aquarium controller. And you might also catch your thermostat kind of going out or not being as accurate on your heaters. So yes, using a secondary source is something I definitely recommend that you do. Now another thing you can do to aid in temperature stability is to use multiple heaters. Now the reason why you do this is if one was to ever fail, the second one would at least be able to keep up with the temperature to the point where you'll catch that dip in temperature on your graph on your controller or you'll notice it during your testing and then be able to go and look in, find that dead heater and replace it accordingly. Now this has happened a couple times on my frag system. Basically I used three cheap heaters that I had laying around that I picked up on eBay. And again, they're connected to the aquarium controller. So when one dies, I noticed that fluctuation. So usually it stays pretty stable between the 78.8 and 79.2. And if I notice it, it's dropping down to maybe 78.7. That means that either I left the door open downstairs and it's freezing cold outside or one of the heaters has died and those two that are left are just not keeping up with the temperature. So then I'll go in there and test, see if the light comes on, feel them, see if they're getting warm and then I just replace it when I need to. Okay, so a quick recap on keeping your temperature stable. You want to pick a temperature and stick with it. Try to stay within a half a degree uh, fluctuation if you can via an aquarium controller. Buy higher quality equipment if possible. Test and calibrate often and use multiple heaters. 
Okay, so let's go to move on to our second water parameter, and that is salinity. Now, keeping salinity or the salt level within your reef tank stable is actually pretty easy. Now, there are some basic concepts that I'll go over here, but keeping it stable is one of the easiest of the three that we have. Now, having a reliable ATO or auto top-off system is your best bet for consistent top-offs of fresh water. Now, there are many different price ranges and qualities that you can look at. I recommend, again, with the heaters, just buying the best and highest quality that you possibly can, preferably one that has a backup system like the Tunzi that I have, has the main eye that dictates the water level. But if the pump was to ever stay on for whatever reason, the secondary float would actually trigger and turn off that pump so I didn't overflow my sump with fresh water or dilute my system to the point that I had way too much uh, fresh water, which dropped the salinity. And uh, again, you just want to get the best that you can and afford. And if you have to top off with hand on a small system until you can afford it, just keep up with it. Check it every day. You'll be good to go. Now, as a reminder, make sure you top off your tank with fresh reverse osmosis water and not salt water. Now, in the beginning, when people are just starting out, sometimes they get confused. They think the water is being evaporated, the salt's gone, and they accidentally top off the salt water. Over time, when doing that, you're eventually going to increase the salinity to the point where it will kill your fish and coral. So always top off of fresh RODI water. Okay, so let's go to move on to testing your salinity and how this impacts the stability of your reef tank. Now, most people who are just starting off will buy all their stuff at the local fish store, and 9 out of 10 times they have what we call a hydrometer. It's very cheap. The store clerk will tell you it works. Yes, it does work to a certain extent, but by all means, it's not something that I recommend to anybody who's looking to keep a consistent salinity level within their reef tank. The reason for this is it doesn't take much for it to not work. An air bubble will get in there. Maybe it's just a crappy brand or bad build quality. It will throw off. You'll think you won't have enough salt when you do. It's just not a good thing, and I definitely recommend that you pass on that and at least upgrade to the refractometer. Now, one thing you want to note about this is over the last couple of years, and I've mentioned this before, the build quality of some of these have kind of gone downhill, and in turn, the reason why I don't use that anymore. But if you decide to use the refractometer, I recommend that you calibrate it at least every single or every other time you're going to use it to make sure that it's accurate and you're getting a good reading. Now, if you want to go a step further and have an accurate system, I would go with the Milwaukee. Again, it's a little bit more money up front, but I'll tell you right now, having three systems in here, testing salinity quite often, this is awesome. Especially when I'm going to clients' houses and doing all that stuff, bringing this with me, knowing that I have an accurate reading and I don't have to fiddle around with the refractometer. It's just a really nice thing to have. Now, I calibrate mine once per month with distilled water. It's good to go. I keep it in its case, and it's awesome. So if you have the money, buy that. If not, then definitely stick with the refractometer and avoid the hydrometer if you can. Okay, let's go ahead and do a quick recap on keeping your salinity stable. The first thing you want to make sure you have is a reliable ATO system, preferably something with a backup in place to prevent it from overflowing the tank. Now, if you can't afford a ATO system, make sure you're topping off by hand at least every day or every other day to keep that fluctuation to a minimum. Second, make sure you're always topping off of fresh RODI water. And thirdly, make sure you're testing with something accurate like a refractometer or a Milwaukee. All right, moving on to our third water parameter. And that water parameter is alkalinity and by far the most important one that I ever deal with within my reef tank. I feel that this parameter has to be stable because even the smallest fluctuation can cause devastating effects on an SPS and Acropora reef tank. Now, if you're dealing with something that's soft coral or you just have a little bit of LPS, you probably don't have to go as full in or extreme as I do and keeping it stable and consistent. But if you're looking for long-term success and to progress into harder corals, I would suggest really focusing on keeping your alkalinity stable. Now, how do you do that? Well, the first thing you want to do is test with a reliable test kit like a HANA checker, and you want to do it often. If you're just starting out and you want to really get a hang of how your tank is reacting to water changes or you just started dosing two-part, you want to test your alkalinity at least once or twice per week. Once you get something stable, like you're using a calcium reactor like you do here on the 300, I only really test once a week just to make any minor adjustments based on the alkalinity fluctuation. Now, I personally like to keep mine at 9.5, and that's it. I don't move from that. If it dips down just a little bit, that's when I'll go and make a little adjustment to the calcium reactor, and vice versa. If it gets up too high, I'll bring it back a little bit. And it's just one of those things that I test, again, every single week to make sure that it stays consistent. 
Now, just like temperature, alkalinity has an acceptable range, and that is between 7 and 11 dKH. Now, you don't want to be at either end of that, so you don't want to be hovering around 7 and then hovering around 11, kind of teeter-tottering back and forth. You don't want to be doing this. Again, just like temperature, pick a number, stick with it, and see how your tank reacts. Now, if you want to jump around from, say, 8 to 9.5, do that slowly over several days. If you have SPS tank, you want to do it over maybe a couple weeks, if not longer, to help with that fluctuation and not to cause any unnecessary stress to your coral. Now, for me, 9.5, I've always seen the best coloration, growth, polyp extension, overall happier reef tank. So I have no reason to go down to 7 or 8 or 8.5 or anything like that. 9.5 is what I stick at, and it's worked out great so far. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about a couple things that can impact the level of your alkalinity. Now, the first thing is going to be water changes. And doing water changes with salt that is not really around your de desired or targeted alkalinity level. Now, what I mean by that is using something that has a 7 DKH salt in a tank that you want to stay at 9.5, that could be a problem if you're doing 50% water changes every couple weeks. Now, if you want to continue to use that salt, you're going to have to break those water changes up to smaller ones to help with that fluctuation. But what you should do is you should find a salt that matches your desired alkalinity level. For me, I use the RPM because it's about 9 out of the box. I like to stay at 9.5, and I only do a 20% water change about once per month to remove detritus, so there is no ill effects or fluctuations based on that amount of water being changed. Now, the next big thing that can impact your alkalinity level is dosing it. That's with a calcium reactor, calc wasser, and even two-part. Now, I talked about dosing two-part in my previous video last week, and basically, to sum it up, you want to dose equal portions of calcium and alkalinity at all times. Now, the calcium reactor automatically does that, so does in the calc wasser, but when you do two-part, you're responsible for dosing equal parts calcium, equal parts alkalinity. That allows the balance to stay within the water, and you don't have to worry about having that fluctuation. Now, another thing to consider when dosing two-part is spreading that dose out as much as you can. For example, my 125 required, before I took it down, it required 220 milliliters every single day of both calcium and alkalinity, and I dosed that over a 24-hour period. So I spread everything out, dosed 24 times a day of both elements, allowing it to get into the tank, be used, but not to the point where I'm dosing too much and it causes a spike in alkalinity. So again, Dosing by hand or by dosing pump, try to spread it out as much as you can and whatever works best for your budget or your schedule. Now, the last thing I want to talk about regarding alkalinity is keeping your equipment clean and basically making sure it's always working properly. Now, when it comes to calcium reactors, this is the adjustment valve. You want to make sure that that's clean, not getting clogged. On your dosing pumps, you want to make sure there's not any kind of salt creep or corrosion getting on the end of the tube. You also want to make sure that your pump is calibrated about every six months to a year, depending on the brand and the quality of the pump that you purchased. And then also just making sure that your media is topped off on your reactor, your pH probe is calibrated, all that good stuff. You want to make sure you stay on top of it to ensure that you're having a consistent and accurate alkalinity being dosed regardless of what method you choose. Okay, so a quick recap on alkalinity. Make sure you pick a number between 7 and 11 dKH. Stick with it, and if you want to make any adjustments, say from 8 to 9.5, make sure you do that slowly over several days to ensure that there isn't any spikes or fluctuations and causing unnecessary stress. Next, you want to go ahead and make sure that you're dosing equal parts calcium, equal parts alkalinity. Keep on top of your equipment maintenance, and don't forget to test often to make sure that you are being consistent and that your dKH is stable. Okay, so moving on to the last part of this video, and that is some things to think about and consider when setting up a reef tank and managing one long term. Now, the first thing here is the more water volume you have, the more stable the system's going to be and more forgiving it's going to be when you make mistakes like overdosing or adding too much food. You know, the number, numerous mistakes that we make here in the hobby will be more forgiving on a bigger system like the 300 opposed to my 30 gallon here that I also have in the fish room. Now, the next thing you want to think about is whenever you do anything, you want to start slow. That's everything. That's uh, dosing, adding fish, adding coral. If you're not familiar on how the tank is going to be affected by something, it's better to go slow and win the race than to go fast, fail, and never finish it. So just keep that in mind when making any changes to your tank. Now, the last thing I can recommend for you is to always underdose opposed to accidentally overdosing. And that goes for two-part, that goes for adjusting calcium reactors, calc wasser, uh, food supplements, coral food, whatever it is. It's always best to go 
under the recommended amount than to accidentally overdose your tank because to add more is a lot easier than trying to get it all out via water changes just further causing stress instability and wasting money so that's about it guys i hope you enjoyed the video if you have any questions please put in the comment section if you liked it definitely get a thumbs up and if you have anything you want to add to the list feel free to also put that in the comment section so until next time i'll see you guys later peace